offense, defense, network security. <laughs> so the things that we're going to talk about today are the things that we see most prevalently when we gain access to environment, privilege escalate, and ultimately end up with domain admin, admin and end up with sensitive information on our hands. So some of this is going to be beating a dead horse or it's going to appear like it because you've heard it a thousand times before, but it's stuff that works still today. We're also going to talk a little bit about the tools that you can use on the blue team to protect your network and to prepare for a pen test and ultimately uh, prevent attackers from getting in. So this is Dave Fletcher. I'm Sally Vandeven. We're both pen testers at Black Hills Information Security. And we both have, prior to working at Black Hills, we were both on the blue team. So we, we know both sides. And throughout the interaction today, so it's a little bit of a shtick, so hopefully you have uh, some tolerance for it. Uh, but Sally's going to be playing the lame blue teamer. And I'm going to be playing the awesome red teamer. So everybody, cheer for me. By the end, you'll know better. So let's start out just by acknowledging that attitude, that red team attitude. Well, I have a little attitude of my own because our network, Dave's going to pen test our network, but look at this Nessus scan. I mean, our network is so tight, there's no misconfigurations, no missing patches. It, it's true, you're laughing, it's true. It's so true. I mean, this is our scan. What's he going to find? It's, it's all info blue, right? Oh, that's absolutely amazing. It's so 2000s of you. You secured all your network services. Ah, amazing. But I bet you still have a crappy password policy and a bunch of users who've never been fished before, so they're click happy and I can send them whatever I want. You do have webmail and some sort of VPN portal, right? Yes. Yes, we have webmail and VPN portal because our users are supposed to be working all the time from everywhere. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to password spread those interfaces. And instead of trying to brute force, I'll go to Twitter or some other venue and gather a list of your usernames, generate email addresses, and then just spray one password across all of them. And then I'll sh I'm sure to end up with credentials. So good luck winning. I'm going to use passwords like fall 2016 or summer 2016 or maybe August 2016 and they're sure to win. Well I got news for you Dave. Our password policy is 15 characters or more, 15 characters minimum. We have a custom complexity filter so not that lame Microsoft use complexity requirements. Your, your t fall 2016, it's not going to work. Oh, wait, one more thing. All the external portals are two-factor. Ha. Yeah, yay, two-factor authentication. You still got users, right? Yeah. Yeah, a bunch of damn noobs. I'm going to send emails to all of them. Include a malicious attachment. That's my old standby. I'll just fish somebody. And then as soon as they get that email, they'll click, and I'll have a session immediately. You think so? Really? We do regular phishing exercises. Our users are so savvy about phishing, but on the end host, we still have all kinds of protection. So I'll humor you. Let's say you catch a fish and you get into one of our hosts. What are you going to do? We use application whitelisting. Application whitelisting. I'm shaking in my boots. I'll just bypass your host protections. I'll get access to a command shell or PowerShell. And then that's really all I need. And then I'll test out that wonderful password policy you've got on the inside of the network. I'm sure that there's some service account hanging out or some admin has set an easy password for somebody just to be nice. Thanks. I don't believe you. Application whitelisting bypass. How do you do it? Well, you probably use something like AppLocker. So I just won't use the typical methods. I won't double click on executables. I won't use the run bar or command prompt to launch applications. I'll use much sneakier methods that AppLocker doesn't even recognize. Tell me what? Can't stand it. Ah, secondary execution. So red server and run DLL. I'll just generate malicious DLLs and load those using those 
built-in tools that you can't restrict access to. And then I'll have access to your machine. So I'll use MSF Venom or I'll use a, a statically compiled command shell and I'll launch that using one of those tools. I don't, it's hard to believe that you actually got me on that one. I think I don't have a solution for that one. But it's good because our network, like I said, is so solid. I will have something to do when I go to work tomorrow. I'll think on that one. Secondary execution. How about I rub a little salt in the wound? One of my coworkers, Brian Fearman, did a blog post and showed us all how to use install util to execute arbitrary PowerShell commands. So now I don't even need PowerShell.exe or PowerShell.ise to do anything. I can just tell it what command I want to run, execute, and I drop the mic and walk out, and I'm done. There's that attitude again. Maybe you should check out the blog post. I think I will. Then, once I get on one of your internal boxes and I've got shell access, I'll use tools like PowerUp, and PowerShell Empire, Metasploit, Bloodhound. I'll search Active Directory looking in Sysfall for GPP passwords. Yes, I know it's passe, but people disable those policies and they don't ever delete those passwords. And guess what? They're usually still good. So once I've gotten into that environment, I'll find things like this and get myself admin access. And then, I'm sure, inside your network somewhere, somebody has granted domain users access to local admins Hi. on some box somewhere. You probably have some box that some developer has and he's desperate so he just keeps on whining and you know, you push over blue team. Not me. Give him access and that's it. Once I'm a local admin, it's all over. Oh, Dave, 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 Dave. I run your tools too, right? Power up, right? Find those misconfigurations, find uh, configurable scripts in auto runs, find weak service permissions, uh, unquoted service paths, hijackable DLLs. I know all those things. Power up tells you those things. And we audit our group membership, our AD group membership. So you're not going to find that uh, domain users in the local administrators group. You're not going to find it on our network. And our users are never admin by default. Right? Everybody tells you, don't run as administrator. We actually do it. Yeah. And we use application whitelisting. Huh. I'm sure I'm going to end up with local admin somewhere. There's just no getting around it. And once I've got local admin, that's just as good as domain admin because I'll just spread from machine to machine, gathering credentials. I'll use tools like Mimikatz to dump plain text credentials from memory and then I'll just keep spidering out like cancer on your network. And then I'll find an admin session and jump to your DC, dump hashes from there, and your entire network is completely owned. Good luck. Well, again, we run your tools, right? We use local administrator password solution. That's a freebie from Microsoft. Make sure that you have a unique password on every system for the administrator account. So when you, if you were to, oh, it's not going to happen, but if you were to get a local admin account, you can't use it anywhere. You can't pivot to any other machine. And then we also, we do some cool things. One of the things we do is write XOR execute. What does that mean? That means where users can download, where they can write to, they can't execute. So if you're going to download something, wherever you're allowed to put it, you're not allowed to execute it. So you just can't execute stuff. And wherever you execute something, those locations aren't writable. That's a good one. That's a good one. And also, we don't allow client-to-client -client communication because clients don't need to talk to other clients. So we just put firewall rules in place because anytime there is client-to-client -client communication, it's these hacker boys. So we shut them down. Our, uh, our, we, we never run domain, admi domain admin accounts on workstations. Domain admins only log in to domain controllers. That's it. 
That's all they do. And they're two-factored. So you're not going to be able to find a machine somewhere with your fancy bloodhound tool where a domain admin's logged in so you can dump credit credentials from memory. You, it won't work. It just won't work. And then we do something really fun, is we plant some honey accounts around. So Dave, poor Dave, he's going to be searching on our network for something because he's doing this pen test and he's not getting anywhere and he's feeling like a failure. So he'll find these credentials somewhere and he'll think, oh, finally, I got something. This is it. And he'll log in with those. And when he does, it's so cool. First of all, the security team gets an email so that we know there's a hacker on the network. And then instantly, within a second, he is logged off and we black hole his IP. So he's done. His pen test is over at that point. Sure, he can try another IP, but, you know, rinse and repeat. He's done. You getting a little worried now, Dave? I'm not worried. Black hole this lady. I'll just scour the environment for sensitive information. I'm sure your users are very diligent in protecting all of that PII and configuration files and I'm, oh, I know that there's clear text credentials out on the network somewhere. So no matter what you do, you just can't win. There may be clear text credentials out there, but they're plants. There's no real ones out there. There's no valid ones out there. Nope. Nope. We do regular audits, again, probably using the same tools, the PowerShell uh, Share Finder and File Finder. We use those tool, too. We find those files. We get them off the network before you can get at them. We also have honey tokens planted on the file system so like that contain web bugs. So he may think he's found a sensitive file, but really it's calling back to our server, logging where and when he's coming, when and where he is, and we can cut him off. It's just so simple. It's so simple. We have all kinds of traps all around because we use some active defense techniques, so many traps that he will just get nowhere. Okay, you got me interested. What are these traps you're talking about? A little too quick. Our traps, we use, um, so the ADHD framework, some of you may have heard f about it. Black Hills uh, has put together this framework of active defense techniques. It's free. You can download it. There's a lot of webcasts about it. But it includes all these cool tools, and some of them that, that we use on our network, one in particular, my favorite, is artillery. That sets up fake services. And so it looks like there's these services running on the box that the, the hackers just can't resist, right? They connect to these services and they get black holes because there's not really a service there. It's just fake. Web Labyrinth. Um, this is a, a maze, a, a website that has links that just create this awful mess. And when the hackers run their scanners against it, it create, it comes up with scanning results that are absolutely useless. And it slows them down, it frustrates them, and hopefully they just give up and go home because they never get anywhere. And then there's Honey Badger, but another one I like very much is Kipo, you may have heard about. That's a fake SSH service. And so you can connect to that, you, you run this, and when the attacker connects to it, he thinks he's found SSH server. Ooh, that's where the good stuff is, right? And it works like an SSH server, and you, he thinks he's connected to the SSH server, but he's not. Every, it's like a key logger, really. And it's just collecting his, what he thinks is his username and password. And it, it, it just confuses him and confounds him, but collects all this information in the meantime. It's awesome. These are all tools in ADHD. You're going to get nowhere on my network, Dave. You sh you're just going to cry. Whatever, Sally. I hate you. <laughs> So what's the, what was the point of that whole shtick? Uh, you know, there are all kinds of tools that are deemed as red versus blue. You shouldn't confine yourself by that. And we see all of this stuff every day. The only reason we highlight it here is because we actually see it. And some of the toughest in environments that we test do all of this. And it's absolutely phenomenal when we come up against that, and it really makes us have to think. We cry. <laughs> yes, we certainly cry. And we usually bring in the entire BHIS team and say, hey, 
what do you guys think about this environment? And it takes all of us brainstorming to come up with solutions to get by all of these protections in place. So be creative when you're applying those protections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the number one on this list is restrict administrative access. You've heard it how many times? A million? Two million? But it's still very common that users are given admin access or that groups are given admin access that are really easy to get at. So most of our customers don't have this top level security that makes us cry. Most of them don't limit admin access. But you have to start doing it because it just makes it so easy. In addition, all of those external interfaces, if they're not two-factor and they're exposed to the internet, good luck surviving. Um, Check out our blog. We have a bunch of blog posts on password spraying external interfaces, and we always get credentials when you have a crappy password policy. There's also a blog post about um, password spraying a two-factored uh, Outlook web app uh, portal. And it's two-factored, so you don't actually, you can't actually get in, but because of it's a timing thing, because of the timing, you can tell when your password, when the password you guessed was right or not. So then you take those credentials to another portal that isn't two-factored. Bingo, right? Um, so password policies, we talked about briefly. So make sure passwords are at least 15 characters or more. And we like to recommend complex passphrases, right? You've heard that too. But surprisingly few companies are, are doing that. Then. Worry about privilege escalation. If you if you've looked at the SANS 20 critical controls or the consensus audit guidelines, control number three is build baselines. That's critically important. If you don't know whether your machines are vulnerable to privilege escalation attacks, you should probably check it out. And don't restrict yourself to using tools that are blue team tools. Use tools like PowerUp that red teamers use and you know they're going to use on your machines to try and escalate. If you don't use them, you're just losing out. So check out all the PowerView tools, PowerSploit, and definitely power up in assessing your baseline configurations. So and then limit client to client communication. Very few people do this, but it's amazing you don't need client-to-client -client communications. Clients talk to servers. Servers talk to other servers. Typically, when clients talk to other clients, like maybe through some chat thing, it's still via a server, right? They're not talking directly together. It's the hackers that do that, right? So just just don't don't allow it. It's 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 a really easy win, and I think on all the tests I've been on, I've seen that once, and it was incredibly hard to get anywhere on that network. It was really, really hard. Next, you want to make sure that you are, are doing application whitelisting. There are bypasses, but if you, if I have to go to the, to the point of developing custom stubs and actually executing, uh, something in a secondary fashion to be able to get a shell on your box, then that makes life tough for me. And in some of the environments that we test that they do this, they couple this with no client-to-client -client communication, and then it's almost impossible. You're running a lot of stuff manually. It's consuming a lot of time from the red team side. Your attackers are going to treat it the exact same way. And then just don't rely specifically on that application whitelisting. Layer your protection. Antivirus, HIPs, NIPs, a good firewall policy. Make sure that it's all in place. You should also disable harmful content. That kind of goes without saying, but people still, again, they don't do it. So if your users don't, if you don't want them to run executables that they download, don't let them to download those in the first place. And filter those based on file signature, not file extension, right? Because that's an easy, easy workaround too. And then don't forget about um, embedded technologies like, like um, Office macros. How often do we use Office macros in phishing? to get our initial foothold all the time. 
if your users, how, ma how many people out there actually use macros in their environment, not pen testers? What? See, one, one. I don't use them in my environment. I use them in other people's environments. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, seriously, if you don't need them, just make sure that's disabled because that's another easy win for us. And going back to uh, uh, those protective tools, do not let users have command shell access or PowerShell. I mean, if a regular user can run command prompt in PowerShell, then an attacker who plants malware on that device can run command prompt in PowerShell and do all kinds of wonderful things just using those tools and the integrated capabilities in Windows. It's complete fail. They don't need it. Don't give it to them. You also want to make sure that your administrators are do performing administration with dedicated admin accounts and on dedicated admin computers. If they're doing their administration on the, their normal daily use machines, the chances that malware is going to end up on that box because of web browsing and email are greatly increased. If you restrict that to where they can only admin on a box that's dedicated, then it's it's really tough to get to those admin credentials. And then lastly, if you've taken care of some of this other stuff and you find yourself maybe with some time, play with some active defense techniques. It is really, really, really fun. It slows the attackers down. It's like an early detection mechanism. Um, and it is just, it is so much fun. And Blue Team really can be fun. It really can. Anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Is there any segmentation in the environment whatsoever? Like start with an OU and then apply it there. And then as you, as you get that organizational unit squared away, especially if it's like business unit, if, if you're dealing with individual business units, they usually only need a common set of tools per business unit. So you apply it there, make sure everything's working well, and then just spider out from, from that location in the network. If you're not segmented like that, then it's going to be really, really tough. So the first thing that I would do is work on creating an OU structure that supports you building different policies for different departments. I, I can add to that that I would also just allow everything and log it and watch and see. And you can develop a list that way without hurting anybody. I mean, you've been running without it all this time, right? So do that for a month or so. And you'll have a really good idea of what you need to start whitelisting. And, and do that for a while. And then you can slowly pare it down. Can you, can you say that a little louder? So how do you restrict access to uh, So there are a couple of resources. Uh, the SANS ISC has blacklists. And you should, OK, yeah, absolutely. How do you uh, scrub web requests going out to the internet if you let your users browse out? How do you identify those bad sites? Uh, a great place to start is the blacklist that uh, the uh, Internet Storm Center publishes. Um, and, and definitely, if you're letting your users browse out to the internet by IP address, you're doing bad. <laughs> Only allow uh, browsing out to actual registered domain names. And then maybe look at the time frame between when that domain name was registered, so kind of a little bit reputation-based, when it was registered and when it's being accessed. Uh, because in many cases, we'll do things like typo squat, We'll register a domain that's really close to your domain, send in phishing emails, and then all the bad stuff comes out to us. And usually you can tell because we don't have weeks before we actually start an engagement. The other thing is that you could use OpenDNS. They kind of do all that for you, right? They do a pretty good job of it. And we've seen a lot of companies that use that, organizations. Cloud proxy.
question? We can take a question. Yeah, if you guys have questions, okay, thanks come on everybody. Over.